chapter 24 verses 1 through 12 this morning. Isn't that neat how God just put it right there, Resurrection Sunday? So stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. Luke chapter 24 verses 1 through 12. The title of the message is Resurrection Morning. So the Word of our Lord, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this that behold two men stood by them in shining garments and then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth they said to them why do you seek the living amongst the dead he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and told these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed them like idle tales and they did not believe them but Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooping down he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself as to what had happened now father we just pray today Lord that Lord just as you opened that tomb 2,000 years ago and brother Sam mentioned this to me this morning the stone was rolled away, not so that you could come out, Lord. Once you were raised from the dead, you could move through time and space. But that tomb, Lord, that great stone was moved away so that, Lord God, we could look inside and see that you were risen. And that you would confirm our faith, strengthen our faith, Lord God, and you would just, Lord, ground our faith in this great eternal truth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that you, Lord, would become more and more real to us in our lives every day. Yes. And that we would walk in your comfort, your strength, and your power. For Lord God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And we pray this in his glorious name. Praise you, Lord. You can be seated. So, resurrection morning. Let me just take you back, and I want to set the setting here. We'll go all the way back. It was Thursday night, and Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is praying, and he prays to the Father, and the Father holds out that cup. And what is in that cup but the sins and the wrath and the darkness of hell. And Jesus prays, Father, if it's possible for this cup to be removed from me, but thy will not mine be done. And Jesus takes that cup upon himself. Our sins, our hell, our darkness. They come and they arrest him. And it's not a few men who come, it's an army that comes. 600 Roman soldiers, the temple guard, the priests, Caiaphas, and this, all the different uh, guards of the temple, and they come with torches, they come with spears, they come with clubs, expecting to find him hiding in the bushes. And when they said, where is Jesus? He stepped out and he says, I am he, he said. Judas comes up alongside of him and he kisses him, identifying him to the leaders. Jesus looks at him and he says, Friend, you betray me with a kiss. They took him before the priest, first and us, then they take him before Caiaphas. He is falsely accused. There are storytellers and con men who come before him and make all kinds of accusations and say things that he never said. He is beaten, he is spit on, and he is mocked. The Jewish leaders have no power to put him to death, so they send him to Pilate. Pilate looks at him and Pilate says to him, don't you realize I have the power over your life for death or for life? And Jesus looked at him and he said, you have no power but the power my Father in heaven has given you. Pilate finds out that he's a Galilean. He sends him to Herod. Herod wants to see him do tricks. He wants to see him do miracles. He does no miracles for him. Herod mocks him. Herod blasphemes him. His soldiers blaspheme him. So he's brought back to Pilate. Pilate doesn't know what to do with him. Pilate has him scourged. The soldiers mock Jesus. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. And then Pilate decides that he's going to wash his hands of the whole situation. So he gives the people a choice. On the Passover, the Jewish people had received this choice that they could select. One of their condemned brothers, 
And so they place Barabbas, a murderer, in front of the crowd with Jesus, and the crowd screams, give us Barabbas, and Jesus is condemned. Pilate makes a what's called a, a titlon that is placed above the head of Jesus. What's going on with that camera? Because if you guys can't get it, turn it off because it's really distracting. See, everybody's gone. <laughs> says on his, uh, this sign that Pilate makes, which he wrote with his own hand, this is Jesus, right, of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He walks to Via Della Rosa carrying his cross. He gets to Golgotha. And on that Friday, they nail him to the cross, his hands and his feet. And on that Friday, he hangs on that cross for six hours. He says to the crowd around him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He cries out to the Father, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Darkness comes over from 12 o'clock until 3 o'clock. And then it tells us he gave up his spirit. He says, Tetelestia. It is finished. And I hope you realize, if you're here today and you were not here on Friday, that he gave up his spirit. Jesus is not a victim. I hope you realize that. One of the greatest misconceptions for 2,000 years, not amongst all Christians, among some, is that Jesus is this poor victim. He is not the victim. He is the victor. He came here to go to the cross and die. He drove himself down the Via Della Rosa to get to that cross. And when he was on the cross, he cried out when it was in his time, when he paid the price for everyone's sins, he said to Telestia, it is finished. They actually were so surprised that he died so quickly that they took a lance and they lanced his side and blood and water fell forth. And on that Friday, Jesus gave his life for us. On that Friday, Jesus was taken down from the cross, his limp, scarred, lifeless, dead body. And on that Friday, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus placed Jesus in a brand new tomb, a rich man's tomb, just as the scriptures had said. And that tomb that day on that Friday was sealed. The next morning on Saturday, Caiaphas and uh, Caiaphas, these guys are the most cunning runs that have ever walked the earth, let me tell you. They're so worried that the apostles are going to come and steal the body that they asked Pilate if he, if he could seal the tomb and he he basically gives orders to put Roman soldiers in front of it, a guard, and they seal the tomb. So when the women come on that Sunday morning, on Sunday morning when the women come to the tomb, they're expecting the stone to be rolled in front. I don't think they fully understood that about the soldiers being there. But they expected the stone to be rolled in front, and they expected to find the body of Jesus inside, they come with spices. It was a, a form of embalming. They would anoint the body. But when they come that morning, that Sunday morning, they find that he is risen. Indeed. <laughs> so let's look. Let's look at this story. You have first the tomb. It tells us in verses 1 and 2, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women were with them. And they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Here they come again with the spices, with these anointing spices. It was to make the body stay smell fresh. See, what they would do is they would lay out the body, they would wrap it in linen, they would anoint the body, and it would stay there for a few days, and then it would be put into what is a, a, basically a stone coffin. So when they, when they come there, again, they're, they're coming to anoint the body. Now, certain women uh, had come, and these were the women who were standing at the cross, and they brought some other women with them, and we know that from Luke 23, 55, and 56. The verses that just precede what I just read to you in Luke chapter 24, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So there are these women who stood at the cross, and they watched him die. And then they watched him taken down from the cross. They watched Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come and take that body. And they watched them place it in the tomb, which was only a short distance, a very short distance. And I'll show you this in a minute. So everything shuts down. So they couldn't go to the tomb during the Sabbath on Saturday. So as soon as you have sunrise on Sunday morning, they go to the tomb. 
Mary Magdalene, <coughs> Joanna, Susanna, uh, Mary, and, I, and there's a bunch of other Marys that are with them. And let me just tell you something about these women. You never hear a bad word about them. You ever hear you hear bad words about John and James, the sons of thunder. You hear bad words about Peter, Thomas is the doubter, right? You hear bad words. Peter denies the Lord. The rest of them desert the Lord. You know, Philip is a, is a calculator, right? You never hear a bad word about these women who were basically, they were his support structure. The entire three and a half years of his ministry, these precious women from Galilee, never a bad word. And so the women, they are there standing, right? at the tomb, and um, he's not there. The tomb's rolled away, and, and he's gone. Now, I want to just share, share a note with you here. In Matthew chapter 27, 57 through 61, let me just show you this. It says, Now, when evening had come, and this is on Friday when Jesus was crucified, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who himself uh, had also become a disciple of Jesus. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in the new tomb, which he had hewn out of rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb, and he departed. Now Nicodemus is with him, and Joseph of Arimathea is a very rich man. He had all his servants with him. And uh, Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. So they watch, they're watching him place Jesus within the tomb. And he and Nicodemus, the other servants, what they would have done is they would have placed him in that tomb, and uh, they would have wrapped the body like a mummy. A mummy, not a mummy, a mummy. A cocoon. And don't mistake a cocoon for a Cancun, okay? We were in Cancun last year, but... This is, uh, uh, his body is wrapped like a cocoon. Linen cloths all wrapped around his legs, his torso, his arms. A special burial cloth that's placed over the face. And then the tomb is sealed. Saturday morning, the cunning runs come along. You notice how some people, they're just like as cunning. And, you know, meet people along, along life like this. They are just as, as cunning and deceitful. They're cunning. They, I mean, oh, they, they don't care about anybody but themselves, their fame, their fortune, their popularity. They don't give a damn about any. That's what these guys are. And what's sad is they're the leaders of the faith. They're the ones in charge of the temple. Jesus is, in, is battling with them all the time. The only thing they cared about was this and their power in their ridiculous legalistic religion. So it tells us in Matthew chapter 27, 62 through 66, on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, okay, this is Saturday, early Saturday morning, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, remember while he was still alive how the deceiver said that three days I will rise, therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now, to understand this, the guard and the sealing of the tomb, a guard is not one guard. They placed, they placed four Roman soldiers in front of the tomb. Four you're wondering where the other guy is. Uh, the other guy is Lucius Oranius Weblatteris. And oh, he's in the room. Lucius! Where are you? There he is, okay? Did you get that there? Right there, there he is. Lucius! I couldn't find a picture with four, four of them in front of me. I had to throw the other guy in there. By the way, uh, Lucius uh, Weblatteris, his, his brother is on the opposite side, right? How did you know that? You, you knew him. So they, they put four Roman soldiers in front of this tomb to guard a dead man. And then they seal uh, the stone. Okay, the idea of, of a seal, a Roman seal, essentially they would put a band around the tomb and then they would put the, the wax, wax, okay, and the signet ring, okay, of Caesar would be placed, the imprint of Caesar. If you were to break that seal, 
That is a capital crime. A capital crime that was punishable by crucifixion. You dead. You break that seal. So in, in light of all of this, when the women come there in the morning, what do they see? They see the stone rolled away. The question, the question becomes, who moved the stone? So a, a story is, is, is propagated by the uh, religious leaders that the apostles came and moved the stones. So in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 and 15, it tells us again, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole away while he slept. There again, the work of the cunning runs. And if this uh, comes to the governor's ears, he will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported amongst the Jews until this day. That the apostles, the fishermen, with a tax collector, came and they somehow overcame the Roman soldiers, and they took the body. I just want you, here's a group of four Roman soldiers. These guys are brutal warriors, experts with the lance, experts with the short sword, and you know what? They were even experts with the shield. They could cap decapitate a person with their shield. <coughs> they're, they're, war they're some of the, the greatest warriors in the history of mankind, and the story that is told is that these guys <laughs> who denied him and deserted him and are in hiding from the Romans because they're thinking, we is next. We are the next ones to go on the cross. That these guys, but Peter needs some at work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Roman soldiers had six packs. Peter had a cake. <laughs> so they come and they find that the tomb is empty. Right? What did they find? They found that he is risen. He's risen indeed. He's risen! Come on, Sammy. You're taking so many notes you forgot. <laughs> Alright, second thing, there's no body. And so it tells us in verse 3, then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, for 2,000 years, they have not been able to find the body. With all the power, you have to understand, the whole city knew what was going on. And the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas and Nunas, and you have the power of Jerusalem, the power of Herod. You have the power of Rome under Pilate. And there's no body. All you have to do is find the body. This, this is, a, this is a, a movement going on in Jerusalem. People are all buzzing about this. And all you need to do is find the body and that's it. Instead, when they went into the tomb, what did they find? This is what they found. I want you to understand. It's, it's, he evaporated out of his burial suit. And it is a cocoon that is now just flat. And that's what the scriptures tell us. In John chapter 20, verses 3 through 7, Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb, right? Mary and the women went and told the apostles. So now Peter and John have this running. This is actually a funny passage. It says, so they both ran together. And then John, who was a little bit younger than Peter, says, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. <laughs> <laughs> And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths laying there. And then notice what it says. It says, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Amen. Now I just want you to, want you to, to think, of, think about it. One, one thing I want you to see, if the apostles went in and they stole the body. Now that the picture is the soldiers are sleeping. And by the way, it was basically a death penalty to be caught sleeping on the job as a Roman soldier. So let's say the, the soldiers are sleeping and, you know, so the apostles come in and say, and they managed to roll that stone away, which weighed about two tons. If you had about a good, good four, four or five of them to roll the stone away, and 
and they go in to steal the body. And they basically, with the soldiers outside, they unravel the entire body, place the cloth there, and then they actually fold the cloth on his head. Could you imagine that? Now, now let me just tell you something. Men, ladies, ladies, how many of your men fold anything? Right? I know there's a couple of neat freaks in there, a couple of guys that are so I fold every. Come on. How many ladies? Some of the women are going like this. Uh, how many of you fold anything? Right? And then you're in there and you're folding it. Now, Tony said amen because Tony and, and Franny sent me this, this beautiful story a few years ago that when a Jewish man in the time of Jesus would sit down and eat, mm -hmm. when he was done with his meal, okay, uh, he would take his napkin and throw it down. But if he, say he, his cell phone rang and he had to go over and, and, and you know, he had to take a call, he would fold the napkin and that would let everybody know that he's coming back and not done with his meal. So don't take away the food. You know what Jesus was saying by folding the napkin? I'm coming back. I just want to say this to you. There's one I, want. I believe that has kind of a dual reference. I believe it's a reference to he is coming back. And I'll tell you something, folks. You look at what's going on in this world. This whole world is on fire right now. Actually, the Lord, I was praying to the Lord last night about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was just thinking about every area of this world that right now is on fire. <coughs> It is, it is frightening. I, I don't think we can go much longer before we literally destroy ourselves as a human race. I think that day is, 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 is upon us. I think, the, I think the Lord is coming. And so I think it's a reference to him coming back in the second coming, but I also believe it's a reference that he would come back over and over again over the course of 50 days and appear to his disciples. So just in, in a short time later, he appears to Mary. Mary Magdalene is the first person he appears to. And what does she think? She's crying. She's weeping. I mean, she's looking at the, the... She's just looking into the tomb. And Jesus is standing there. And she thinks he's the gardener. She says, gardener, where did you take his body? I mean, so, and then he says, Mary. You ever have Jesus call your name out and hear it in your heart? It's a special thing when Jesus says to you your name. And she knew right away that it was Jesus. Later that night, he appears uh, to the apostles. Later that uh, day, he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. And there are ten appearances that you see in the Gospels before Jesus ascended into heaven of his appearances. And let me show you. Let me show you something you need here. This is Golgotha, the place of the skull. Golgotha means, means skull. Uh, Calvary is the Latin. Golgotha is the Hebrew. Uh, it means skull. This, this, I believe, is a very accurate place in Israel. And I believe that on this hill, right above this skull, is where Jesus was crucified. Been there a number of times. Been there over seven times. In 1867, General Gordon, a, a British general, he's in his hotel room in Jerusalem, and he's looking out over the city, and he sees... Golgotha. He sees the skull. And he knows, he's a, Bible, he's a Bible student, so he knows what the story says, that if that is the place of the skull, there should be a tomb nearby. So he's got a lot of power, and he gets a bunch of archaeologists and excavators, and they go and they excavate the entire area. And the expectation is, if this is Golgotha, within just a stone's throw, you're going to find a tomb of a rich man. And so they, they unearth the entire area, and what do they find? They find a tomb. Literally, a stone's throw away. It is a rich man's tomb. Because it's hewn out of stone. It took a lot of money to be able to go in there and you know, basically clear the thing. There's also a cistern, a water, a water well, dug into the ground in the stone that is incredibly large and deep. If you remember when we were in Israel, some of you, we, we were standing over it, looking down at it, and it would have taken lots of money, okay, to be able to make that well in the ground, that, that system. When he goes in, it's interesting, he doesn't find any body in there. No body. And the thing is, after 2,000 years, you find something. If, if, if the body is still there, 
you're going to find some kind of remains. You're, you're going to find a, a skeleton. You're going to find it, maybe it's, it might be a deteriorated skeleton, but you're going to find something, and there's no remains there. And what he's done, he's taken, he's taken the biblical story, and he has found a, an archaeological location that fits the biblical narrative. So I want to show you just, just here what it tells us in John chapter 19, 38 to 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. And then they, they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. In the place where he was crucified, uh, where was the gar a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. And so they laid Jesus between the Jews, preparation day, uh, for the tomb was nearby. So what that's saying is, right near Golgotha is this tomb. And that's exactly what uh, the general and the archaeologists found. They found this tomb, and that's the inside of the tomb. It's interesting because the actual tomb, all the different components of a rich man's tomb, there's a weeping chamber. People could come in and they could weep. There's uh, the burial chamber. And then there's this deep trowel. And by the way, a big stone with a deep trowel costs a lot of money to make. And it's all an indication that this was a rich man's tomb. It's a picture I took when I was in Israel. Jesus would have been laid on a slab right uh, above those two protruding pieces of stone. Some of you have been in there with me, right? I'll show you some pictures. That's Ritter Savino coming out of the tomb. <laughs> That's Len Savino coming out of the tomb. That's Alicia Pugh coming out of the tomb. Kim Luker coming out of the tomb. That's Rick and Debbie to here coming out of the tomb. That's my favorite. Look at Rick. Like, he looks like he's really coming out of the tomb. <laughs> Joanne Fabian coming out of the tomb. Uh, here's my bride coming out of the tomb. And this is me coming out of the tomb. You will notice that the Shekinah glory is so powerful in there that my head is just radiating the light of the Lord. <laughs> it is an awesome place. Just, just a, a few feet away from there, we have a worship service, the communion service. And just, I don't know, 50 feet away from there is Golgotha. And I'll tell you, we go to a number of sites in Israel, and there's, I try to treat this with a little integrity. Some of the sites, I don't believe the actual sites that they claim them to be. By the way, the upper room that we go to, I don't believe that's the upper room. The upper room would have been underground, and this is above ground. They had to excavate it to be able to find the original sites. We go to them, we find a number of them. But this, I believe, according to the biblical narrative and the archaeological discovery, this is the place where Jesus was raised. And the body's still not there. The body's still not there. Why? Right? He is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. Good. That was better. Okay. <laughs> let me show you, let me show you a, a, a third thing here. The angels. So in verse 4 through 7, it tells us, And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Now, I just want you to notice the word remember. And the angel is quoting what Jesus said. He said this over and over and over again. Remember. See, when we forget, we get into trouble. When we forget the scriptures, we are going to end up in trouble. When you forget the scriptures, then your faith is going to start to fade. The more you are in the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So here they have forgotten what Jesus said. And let me just let me just show you here just very quickly. Matthew 16, 21. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and the third day be raised. Hmm. Again, in Mark chapter 8. One, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days he must rise again. Listen, folks, if I stood before you today and I said, listen, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. I come from God. And on Tuesday, I'm going to be killed. 
But on Friday, I'm going to rise from the dead. Now, Friday comes. And I'm as dead as a door now. Friday comes. And, and there's no breath. Friday comes, I'm not rising, I'm rotten. <laughs> what would you say? He's a liar, right? You say he's a fake, or maybe you walk away and say, my pastor's a lunatic. <coughs> I want you to understand what I'm saying to you. <coughs> he bet everything on the fact that he would rise from the dead. Everything. He, he, he put everything at stake. And had he not risen, I mean, this is his, his followers. Somebody, somebody teaches you for three and a half years, you walk with them, you leave your businesses to follow him. You're just caught up with him for three and a half years, and he's saying to you, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. They're going to beat me, spit on me, kill me, crucify me, and on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. And the third day comes, and he's not risen. You know what happens? And you're just done. You ever, you ever been done with somebody who makes promises to you? You're done with them. Somebody gets your hopes, they build up your hopes and build up your hopes and, build, and then all of a sudden they just don't poop on you? You're done with them. He staked everything on the fact that he would rise from the dead. If he's not risen, right, it's all fake. It's a fraud. You know, Paul, look at the Apostle Paul. This is again, the, the honesty of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 through 19. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And in this life, only we have hope in Christ. We are, of all men, the most pitiable. Pitiable. You don't understand? If Jesus hasn't, hasn't risen, let me bring Mr. T on this. I pity the fool, right? That, that's, that's it. I pity the fool. Because it, 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 your, it, your faith is empty. It's empty. It's futile. It's useless. It's dead. He bet the ranch. Tim Keller says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Amen. And when, again, they got there, and the tomb was empty, and they didn't find the body, and the stone was rolled away, <coughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, number four, his word. And it says in verse 8, and they remembered his words. The angel spoke, and they remember. See, they, again, they had biblical amnesia. I see when Christians get in trouble, they have biblical amnesia. They have forgotten his promises. They, they have forgotten that you know what he has promised to be with them and never forsake them. I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. For death, neither death nor tribulation nor demons nor anything else shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ that is in uh, that the, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But he has promised us, promised us, promised. The Bible is filled with promise. When we lose sight of his word, we are in trouble. And that's what got them into trouble. They had lost sight of his word. Because the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It can cut through. It cuts through your unbelief. It cuts through your doubts and your excuses and your pride and your nonsense. And all of your crap. Right. And that's what it's done for me. 34 years ago, it cut through my, my atheism. The Word of God cut through. I read a book and it was filled with Scripture. And the Word of God, for the first time I was reading Scripture, it cut through all of my unbelief and I became a believer. I went from being an atheist on Friday night to a Christian on Monday night. And I was a pretty solid atheist for about 10 years. It tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. And you may fall. You may fall for the lies of the devil every day, but the Word of God stands forever. 
It never bows to public opinion. It never kowtows to political correctness. Uh, it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything, everything, everything will fade away, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And if you build your life upon this foundation, you will stand firm through eternity. If you build your life upon the lies of this world, you're going to crumble and you're going to fade away. The Word of God, it tells us, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is the light unto our path in this very dark and deceptive world that is filled with con men, liars, and deceivers. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is like a fire. You know, it's like a fire. It burns away our sin. Mm. It burns away our selfishness and our, and our greed, our, our self-consumption and our, our, our egotism. And it puts a burning, a burning fire in our hearts, a passion for God and for what is right and true. And it says, it is a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. It is the hammer that can break the hardest heart. And make it soft and moldable in the hands of the Savior. The Bible tells us the word of God is sweeter also than honey and dripping of the honeycomb. Sweeter than honey. It refreshes our souls. It refreshes our minds. Don't you find that? It refreshes our, our, our very bodies. It tells us that the word of God is the bread of life. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Don't you find this every day when you come to the Word of God, that the Word of God energizes you. The Word of, the word of God gives you strength. I've said this, I've never, ever, in 34 years, come to the Lord in prayer. And I always come to the Lord in prayer with the Word of God open. But I've never had a time, and this, this is... Thousands and thousands of those meetings with God where I did not walk away stronger than I went in. The Word of God straightens us. Prayer strengthens us. And it tells us that the Word of God, it washes us and cleanses us. Ephesians chapter 5, 26, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with water through the Word. Don't you find that to be true when you come to the Word of God? It, it washes your filthy thoughts. It washes away your, your fears and your, your anxious thoughts and your limited thoughts and your mediocre thoughts. It washes away all those things so that we can be renewed. And the Word of God in James chapter 1, 23 to 25, the Word of God is a mirror. When you come to the Word of God, see the big quest, this was a big quest when I was growing up in the 70s and 60s. Everybody was trying to find themselves. Remember that? You gotta find yourself. I'm sure that's something that's true today. People are trying to find themselves, and there was crazy stuff that was taught about finding. It was like you had to peel off all the stuff in your life. It was almost like you're peeling an onion. When you peel off an onion, you get to the middle of the onion. What do you have? Nothing. You just got stinky hands and tearing eyes. You know where you will find yourself? You want to really find who you are? You'll find yourself in this book. And you know, you know what you're going to find when you, when you come into this book? You're going to find some things really amazing because the two main things that the Bible reveals is it reveals to us who our Father in Heaven is and it reveals to us who we are. I'm going to quote to you. I'm going to quote you. This is all Scripture. What the Bible has revealed to Frank Lola about Frank Lola is that I'm created in the image and likeness of God. Wonderfully and marvelously made and created a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. That I have been redeemed. I'm a sinner who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And he calls me a saint. If you come from the Catholic background, you're wondering, I thought saints were only those special people who are saying, no, no, the Bible says all those in Christ are saints. Amen. He calls me a child of God. He calls me a priest. He calls me an ambassador. He calls me a minister. He calls me a servant. He calls me a king. In Revelation 1.6, he says to me that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And he tells me that all things are working together for my good because I love him and have been called according to his purpose. That's what God has revealed to me about me in the scriptures. 
I don't think anything that you will ever find in any self-help book, anything you will ever find in any self-help speaker could ever compare to what the Bible says about you. Praise God. It's a mirror. And God suddenly begins to reveal to us who, who we truly are through the Scriptures. Last thing here, number five, transformation. So in verse 9 and 10, and they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven, to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Now, I just want you to focus just for, on, on one of these women, and that is Mary Magdalene. And um, there's a lot of misconceptions about Mary in the scripture. I was watching the movie last, uh, last night, The Great Story Ever Told, and they, they portray Mary as the one who came in and wept at Jesus' feet, and they portray Mary as the one who anointed Jesus' feet. That's, that's, that doesn't tell us. There's, there are many Marys, mm -hmm. and there were other Marys. But let me just tell you what we know about Mary Magdalene. The scriptures tell us that Mary Magdalene was a woman who had demons in her, and Jesus cast them out. Mm -hmm. And she became a follower of Jesus in Galilee. She was from Magdalene, and that's a little, 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 little village right on the Sea of Galilee, not far from Capernaum. And that Mary followed Jesus right to the cross, and she's one of the, of the very few who stood there and watched him bleed and watched him suffer. And she watched him take on her sins. And she heard his words from that cross, that great sermon he preached from the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken by the, by the Father, abandoned by God. He took hell upon himself, our hell upon himself, that darkness. He said, I thirst. And as I said to you when I put the the vinegar and the water up to his mouth. He didn't want vinegar and water. I think the thirst was he was thirsting for their love. Mm -hmm. And here was one who truly gave him that love. And then he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. To tell us the earth, it's finished. But Mary was there. And Mary watched him die. Now, early Sunday morning, Mary goes to the tomb. And she's there with some of the other women to anoint the body, but he's not there. And she's sitting outside the tomb. The other women began to make their way back to the apostles, and she is grieving. She, she, is, she is distraught. You go through, you've gone through the, 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 the times of, of a funeral and seeing a loved one who has died, and you know how, how distraught you can become, how numb you can become. I mean, it's, it's like you become to numb, numb to everything around you, and you can just cry for, for hours, if not days, and that's what Mary's going through. So Jesus, he comes to her. Now people say, well, you know, why didn't Mary recognize Jesus? Maybe because there were so many tears in her eyes that she could not see him. Maybe because she was staring in the wrong place. She's looking in the place of death instead of looking in the place of life. And Jesus is standing there. And she thinks he's the gardener, which is really funny. And um, I don't know, maybe he had on a gardener's hat or something. I don't know. And he just whispers to her, Mary. And she immediately knew it was him. And she says, Rabboni. And what does he tell her to do? He says, now go back and tell. Right? Go and tell what, what you've seen. But you know what Mary does? She grabs on to him. Right? You know what Mary? Mary is, is grabbed, she's grabbed on to him, and she don't want to let him go. You know what he says to her? Mary, you have to let me go because I'm going to go to my father. And what Jesus did during that period of 50 days, he went back and forth. He'd go to heaven, hang out with his father, come back down, and he'd appear with the apostles and hang out with them. She says, he says to her, you have to let me go. You can't cling to me. Want to tell you a little secret about Mary? So she'll... In that moment, Mary let him go, but the truth is, he never let her go. He never let her go. And you know why? 
She never let him go. I've known Jesus for 34 years. He has never let me go. Never. He has clung to me for 34 years. I don't know if you have the eyes to see this morning. Do you see him here with us? I know he's here. He was up there with me this morning. He was uh, with me this morning when I woke up in prayer. But he has always been there. He's always with us. And um, he's always clung to me. I haven't always clung to him perfectly. Sometimes if you saw Pastor Frank through the years, it's like I'm clinging onto the back of his garment as he's walking along. I'm like, I'm holding, I'm, I'm on, I, I've got him. But it, it's, it's not always been this, but he's always, he's always held on to me. So Mary uh, goes back and she tells the apostles. Does exactly what he told her to do. And you know what they did? They mocked her. These chidrules. It's a thick head in Italian. And their words, right, the women seemed to them like idle tales. And they did not believe them. Later that day, they believed. Later that day. So here's, a, here's our, 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 our wrap up. I'm going to give you just a, a simple key application. Let me, let me just say this to you. Jesus died on the cross for you. Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago, and he is God's substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Those nails that went into his hands, they were meant for me. The nails in his feet were meant for me. The cross on his back was meant for me. The total separation and abandonment from the Father was meant for me. That's what hell is. Hell, hell is, you want nothing to do with me. You do not want my salvation. You do not want my grace. You do not want my son. And I am left with nothing to give you what you want. Understand that. You know, there's a verse in the book of Acts. Peter said, people choose hell. I've done everything I can to save you. But you don't want me. So you can go into an eternity totally, 100% separated from me. And people will say, well, I'm separated from him now, so what's so bad about this? No, you're not. Because the image of God is still within. The image of God and the worst person on this earth, as horrible as they are, they still have the image of God. As scarred and as hard and as, as covered with crap as it can be, the image of God is still in that person's heart. When, when that person dies, if they have rejected everything that he has done for them, they have rejected Jesus, they've rejected his grace, they've rejected his drawing, his drawing to, uh, to the Lord, then God is left with nothing but to strip them of everything good. That's where hell, there's no more joy, there's no more happiness, there's no more peace. It's, that's all God. And he strips that. And that's why you look at, look at the descriptions of hell and the scriptures that Jesus gives us. He describes it as fire. You ever been burned? There ain't nothing more painful, I'll tell you that. You ever been burned? Okay, okay. I, I, listen, I've torn ligaments in my hip. I've torn tendons in my hip. I've torn tendons in my knee. I've torn tendons in my ankle. I had paralysis on my left side. I've dislocated my shoulder. Got through all this stuff through life. Nothing has compared to when I have been burned. And I haven't had major burns. Used to have a, uh, a wood stove. Stick my arm in there. How many times I burned my arm? Let me tell you, when the skin is sizzling and you can smell it, that's why he describes it as fire. And it's described as complete, utter darkness. Because he is light. Now he hung on that cross six hours that Friday to keep you from that. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead, and now he offers you life. And that is life abundant. You can have an abundant life now. 
and it is life eternal, and you can enter into that eternal life now, and you can receive, listen to this, the assurance of your salvation. The scripture says that when a person takes Jesus into their heart, Romans chapter 8, that the Spirit of God testifies with their spirit that they are a child of God. That's God saying to you, you're mine, and you are mine forever, and that when you die, you're going to be with me forever, and there's nothing, nothing, nothing that could ever separate you from me. And that is a wonderful thing to have, to know, and that's why I could see some people's faces today when I came down and said, and I'm praying to the Lord, and I said to the Lord up in that room this morning, Lord, if you want to take me now, you can take me. I have, I have no doubt that when I die, I am going to go to be with him forever. And that is not because I am a pastor. That is not because I have built churches. That is not because I am some, somehow some wonderful person. I, I, I'm not. I'm a sinner who has been saved by grace. Amen. But he has put in my heart that assurance that if I was to die today, that I would go to be with him. Amen. And you can have that. I've watched people die with it. And I've watched people die without it. And I want to tell you, there is a big difference. And those, those, those heroic, brave people who are not afraid to die, when I've watched them die without it, I've watched them die with tremendous fear in their heart and uncertainty. And when I've watched people die with that grace in their heart, right? Some of you have experienced it. It's so different. It's so different. You can have that salvation this morning. See, how, how do I get that? Jesus said, repent. You know what repentance is? It's admitting you're a sinner. It's saying to God, look, look, there's no cover up here. I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I've fallen short of the glory of God. If, if, just, if you doubt you're a sinner, let me just, let me just give you just a, a, brief, a brief just little you know, summary of, of some of the commandments. If you don't think you're a sinner, have you ever lied? Because that's one of the commandments, thou shalt not lie. How many times do you think you lied for your life? What did God put up the on the screen right now? Every lie you've ever told since you've been born. I mean, could you imagine that? I don't want to show that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for wiping that out. Have you ever stolen anything? <clears throat> think of all the times you stole if you put that on the screen. How about blaspheming the name of the Lord, taking the Lord's name in vain? You ever take the Lord's name in vain? Think of uh, JCs and GDs. Well, that could run for a couple of days, right? Coveting. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And repentance is acknowledging before Him, Lord, I'm a sinner. And then he says, you repent and you believe, and belief is putting your faith in Jesus, that he is God, that he is the Lord, that he's the Savior, and that he died for you on the cross. He took your place on the cross. When I say to you, those were nails meant for me. They were. I would have suffered a crucifixion for eternity in hell. That cross was meant for me. If, if you truly believe he died for you, you're going to realize that. And when you repent and you put your faith in him, he's going to come into your life through his spirit, and he's going to give you a new life. And you will experience a new life, and you will never be the same again, just like Mary Magdalene was never the same again. You will never, ever be the same again for all eternity. I ask you today, if today is the day, and what a glorious day it could be. Today, this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, 2018, you become the day of your salvation. And if you repent and you believe in Jesus, you can receive that salvation and that assurance in your heart. So I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads. I'm going to ask everybody here just to be still. very simple, the prayer that I prayed when I gave my life to Jesus 34 years ago. You will pray this from your heart and you will mean it. You will be sincere in your prayer. God will hear your prayer. And you will, you will experience the salvation of the Lord. But say right now to the Lord with your head bowed, Lord, 
I ask you for forgiveness. Lord, I confess to you that I have sinned and I have fallen short of your glory. I have broken your commandments. I have done things, Lord, that I know in my heart are wrong. Hurt others. And Lord Jesus, I put my faith in you today as my Savior. I'm putting my faith in you, Lord, that when you died on that cross, you took my sins. They were nailed up there on that cross with you. And that now today, Lord, I receive you as my Savior, as the forgiver of all my sins. And Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart, you the living Savior, and give me your life, your eternal life. And I'm going to ask you just to keep your heads bowed and just listen to what I'm going to say to you. Whenever Jesus called people throughout the scriptures, he always called them publicly. He called them out of the crowd. I'm going to ask you right now, if you prayed that prayer this morning to take Jesus into your heart, would you look up at me and just lift up your hand and acknowledge, God bless you, God bless you. If you prayed to take Jesus, God bless you, ma'am. If you prayed to take Jesus, God bless you. If you prayed to take Jesus into your heart, we have a number of people who have just raised their hands. If you prayed to take Jesus into your heart this morning, would you acknowledge by lifting up your hand? Anyone else who prayed that prayer this morning? Another person raising their hand? I want to give you a second. If there are people in the overflow who have raised their hands, I want the ushers to take notice of them because what we're going to ask you to do, we're going to stand and we're going to finish the service with a, a song, but I'm going to ask you to come forward. If you raise your hand to accept Jesus this morning, we want to open the altars and invite you to come forward. Is there anyone else here, I'm looking out, who prayed that prayer this morning to take Jesus into their heart? To make a public prayer. Listen, he had the courage to go to the cross and die for you. You have the courage to be able to step out of the crowd today and just acknowledge by lifting up your hand that he is your Savior. And that you just prayed that prayer. Anyone else who prayed that prayer this morning? Jesus may be passing through your life, and I hope, I hope you know you may never have this chance again. <laughs> Anybody else who prayed to take Jesus in their heart this morning? Okay. Let's all stand. We're going to open the altars. I want to encourage you, if you raise your hand this morning, to take Jesus into your heart. We would like you to come down. We'd like to give you a Bible. We'd like to pray with you. And um, the altars will be open if you'd like to come forward for prayer. Thank you, Pastor Frank. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word.